The NBA postseason is heating up. We got plenty of NFL draft conversation to get to as the countdown oh. is down to eight days now as we approach round one. Michael Lombardi and Stormy Bonantoni with you as we welcome you in to the Lombardi line presented by DraftKings live on VSIN and DraftKings Network. Michael, but we got to start with what's on Michael's mind today because there's a lot of news that's been coming out around the country today. What you got today, my friend? Well, you would think that today being the playoff in for the 76ers, that would be on my mind. But I, I put that on the back burner wow. because I'm so used to being depressed. <laughs> I'm so used to being disappointed that I welcome disappointment from the – like they can't hurt me anymore. Like there's no way they could give me a cold shower again. Like I, there's no – I'm immune to it. Like I've got it, right? I mean, I, I can only imagine how Jet fans feel, right? Like the, to me, it's you, – you're just – you become immune to it. What's on my mind is this ridiculous commentary from the Atlanta Falcons organization. It's one thing to not want Belichick as the head coach. No problem. You don't want the guy who's won six Super Bowls. You've won nothing in your career. You've changed uniforms every two years. Rich McKay's been there since 2003. No big deal. You keep going on that course. You're perfect. Everything's great. You don't want him. No problem. But to sit there and say he wasn't in your top three. To sit there and honestly be quoted as saying behind the scenes that he wasn't the third, at least in the top three coaches you considered, is insulting my intelligence and it shows your stupidity. You're so stupid that you're willing to admit this. So next year, when you go seven and 10, you don't think this quote's coming back to haunt you? Like now you just put more pressure on your team. It, it, It really is comical. It's comical and it's almost revealing to the America about the ineptitude of most of these NFL teams. Terry Fontenot's won 21 games in three years as a general manager. His number one assistant, the great Ryan Pace, drafted Mitchell Trubisky and, 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 and Justin Fields in Chicago and left a disaster behind. And yet these are the people judging Belichick and telling you he's the third best. Like, I, I find it hard to believe. You don't want to hire him? No problem. No problem. But then don't insult yourself out the door. So, Michael, especially like when you look at the Falcons side of this and for anybody who missed it, there is a massive, long ESPN article that came out today detailing the why with a number of unnamed sources. Michael is quoted in the article as well. The why behind him not getting the job in Atlanta. There's some ties with Robert Kraft and what he may or may not have said to Arthur Blank throughout the process. But how much of the Falcons side of this, Michael, just reaffirmed to you that guard your desk mentality? Because that was all that I really saw coming through. It clear. I mean, look, let's be clear. Rich McKay is in charge. He's the guy who's been in, 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 in Atlanta since he left Tampa. He is Arthur Blank's number one human being. He's in charge of Arthur Blank's estate, okay? So he didn't want Belichick coming in. Even though they played the game that he was not going to be involved, he's always involved. He's always involved. And when you have that relationship with the owner and you know you can manipulate the owner, you let things kind of play out. And so – Ultimately, this is kind of all those quotes in there. Like, if you truly believe what you're saying, put your name behind it. Like, I put my name behind it. I wasn't Mm -hmm. going off the record with the guy. I mean, I know Seth for a long, long time. We're huge Springsteen fans together. You know, I've talked to him before. Sometimes I disagree with what what he writes. But I wasn't going off the record because, to me, somebody's got to defend the winningest coach of all time behind Don Shula. They treat him like he's a pedestrian, that he just showed up. I mean, you're telling me that Raheem Morris, that we've forgotten all about his Tampa experience, you know, as a head coach, that was just because he was too young. Okay, great. Well, Rich, who was in Tampa when he was there? Like, this was a setup. Like, don't insult my intelligence. It's, It's almost ridiculous. And that they actually are promoting this. If I were an Atlanta Falcon fan or if I was doing talk radio in Atlanta, I would be more mad at Atlanta than this because it shows your stupidity. It's uh, it, it's definitely interesting, especially just just to hear those words that the the exact verbiage in the article. 
was talking about the way that Blink talked about Bill Belichick mm. over Super Bowl week, called him a living legend. But what Blank didn't say was that he and his top lieutenants had voted on the team's head next head coach, ranking each candidate, and Belichick didn't even finish in anyone's top three. He was essentially voted off the island. The greatest coach of all time didn't come close, and that was as close as Belichick would come in 2024. That is, again, from the ESPN article this morning from Seth Wickersham, yeah. Don Van Nata, and Jeremy Fowler. Stormy, can I tie this back into the 76ers Please. again? Please. Because there's a quote in there from the great Josh Harris, the owner of the 76ers, who believes that his model in Philadelphia of hiring the GM and letting the coach work is the best model of all. Now, I'm going to look around here, but I haven't seen Philly 76ers win a title since anywhere. I haven't seen them get to a conference championship game since Larry Brown left. Like, you're, you're telling me you know what it is to win sports? That just showed me he has no clue, which is what I've been saying as a Sixer fan. Like the way he built the organization, they got no chance to win there. They won't win. And they're never going to a conference championship. I don't care. The process in beads, the greatest, the MVP. Forget about it, all right? Just forget about it. You can put that away. And then he's sitting out there promoting, I like, my, I like the way I set up my structure. Your structure stinks. You can't win anything. And you're proud of it? Give me a break. Yeah, they haven't won anything. The commanders now, obviously, that Josh Harris is, is the owner of as well, have done nothing yet. We'll see how things play out there. The Falcons have yet to have the success that they've been trying and feeling so close to get to over and over again. So it's definitely interesting to, to close up put a bow on the Bill Belichick of it all for now, at least um, he will, it appears be on the Pat McAfee show next week as a part of their draft coverage. And I think that'll be great to get some insight behind the curtain, right. Of, of what it's been like for him. And he mentioned something while he was on Pat McAfee today, kind of previewing what's going on about how everyone's draft board in the NFL, Michael is so different. And at times it can be drastically yeah. different. <laughs> No question. And this is what I keep saying to everybody here. We cannot make fun of who you pick and where you pick them because everybody's evaluation is different. Everybody's expertise and evaluation is different. Everybody sees the game differently. You know, there's dramatic differences in what people see and what's on the tape. So you're not going to build a consensus. So if you want to sit here and say they shouldn't pick J.J. McCarthy at three, you may be right, but it's going to take us three years to get there. And my that's my point. Like, we have all these mock drafters that go on TV and say they picked him too early. Well, what's too early? If the guy becomes really good, is that too early? Right? When you pick Tyree Wilson over Jalen Carter, you can have this conversation, right? You could have an honest conversation. Now, if Wilson comes in and plays really well, that's a different story. But you're passing up a three technique for an edge rusher, which there's more edge rushers. That's the conversation. But Belichick's right. This board is all over the place. And the quarterback board is all over the mm -hmm. place. And so it's very hard to get a consensus because we know that the quarterbacks, we know four are going to go in the first round. And I'm really convinced five will go in the first round. And if that happens, if it happens to be Bo Nix or if it happens to be Michael Penix, just look at it and say, okay, we'll see how they play. Well, and to your point, Michael, about there being four for sure that we know are going and, and going early based on all of the projections that we've seen and heard about through the, through the chains here, we still aren't even firm on what the order of what that'll be. And there was a report from Albert Breer, who, by the way, is going to be joining us coming up in just a little bit. We'll have Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated, MMQB, as well as uh, Harry Gagnon that are going to join us this hour. But he was talking about how the commanders are having an influx of prospects, their top 30 visits, just kind of a mass visit, which includes today four quarterbacks. So no Caleb Williams, but they're going to have Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, and Michael Penix Jr., all in the building at the same time. And while on the surface, that seems a little bit crazy that you're going to have all of these guys in here. And do you not already have in mind at this point in the process, what you want to do with that number two overall pick if you're Washington. But what Belichick said was we have had, they and the Patriots past have had as many as a dozen players come in on the same day so they could see them work together. And that bringing in a lot of guys for a draft visit is a really efficient way to compare players and for your staff to get to know them quickly. 
Yes, and so what will happen is you can get them all in the same room. We brought Jimmy Garoppolo in and Johnny Manziel in the same day. And so you didn't have to have two separate days to teach the same thing. You put them in the room, you see how they respond, and basically you're in a controlled competitive environment. You know, you're sitting there, you know these two guys are competing against you for the second overall pick or the third or wherever you are. You want to show your best. You're going to find out how competitive they are and how important is it to them. How important is it? I want to show my best. I want to show you what I have. That's really important. And so you can create that setting by doing this. If you just bring one in the next day and you take them out to dinner, you're not learning anything. You're recruiting. There's a difference between recruiting and trying to get behind the player, right? Recruiting's for college. The NFL's no recruitment. You're selecting. And the best way to learn about players is to put them in a competitive environment. Did it surprise you that they're still doing their their homework in that competitive environment with us being so close to the draft now? Because I would have thought, and maybe this is just me being naive because I'm not a I'm not privy to those conversations in the process. Like I would think that eight days away, number two overall pick, you already know who's going one. I know who I want to take it to. Right. I, I think they do know, but I think they want to make sure that nobody else knows. And then they bring everybody in. And I think they want to reinforce what they already know. If they're objective, right? Right? The 76ers bring Markel Fultz in. He had a a horrendous workout, but they overlooked it. So what you can't do, what Josh Harris' team did in Philadelphia, is when you do bring them in, don't have the end in mind already. you got to be objective. you got to have your bias removed from it and then see how they actually handle it. This is Great conversation, great insight. And let's continue to roll this over with Albert Breer, NFL insider, who's going to join us coming up next right here on the Lombardi line. Get his thoughts on all of that with what's going on in Washington today, the Bill Belichick of it all, and more. Stay right here on the Lombardi line. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSEN, the sports betting network. We call it the off season, but in the NFL on days like today, it feels far from off. Boy, this league is 24-7, 365 as we welcome you back <laughs> to the Lombardi line presented by DraftKings. Michael Lombardi, Stormy Bonantoni with you. And as we continue hitting some of the big stories in the National Football League today, very grateful to have Albert Breer join us here on the Progressive Guest Line, senior NFL reporter, lead content strategist for the MMQB. You can also catch him on NBC Sports Boston. So very dialed in when it comes to what's going on with this Patriots and Belichick and Kraft situation, Mm. the job with the Falcons. Like, how have you unpacked the report that came out today? Well, I mean, I I don't know. I I just think it's sort of a sad commentary on the league that, um, you know, you had seven openings, um, you know, obviously excluding the New England one um, that, that were out there, the greatest coach of all time. He wants a job and he can't get one. Um, and look, like I say that with the acknowledgement that not every job was going to be set up for him. I think it's similar to Brady um, four years ago, you know, where Brady was always going to have a narrower group of teams because you have to check a lot of boxes to be in the running for him. Um, same thing with Bill. You need to be in a position to win now. Geographically, it has to make sense for him, has to make sense for the staff. He wants to bring all of that uh, makes sense. But um, with a guy at that level out there, um, The idea that he wasn't able to get a job, I always thought, was kind of more of a reflection on the state of ownership in the NFL and where owners are. And, um, you know, I think more than anything else, it's it speaks to what owners value right now. And, um, you know, I think, you know, more often than not, you're seeing owners who you know study this stuff in other sports and want to carry things over and have their own ideas. And they're valuing the structure of their organizations over individual people. Um, you know, even when there's an opportunity to get somebody truly great in the organization and build around him. And um, I certainly think that that was the case here. Um, you know, I think that there's concern with some people that he's going to come in and walk all over everybody, whether or not that's, you know, reality or not. Um, there is that perception out there. You know, I think that concerns some owners. And so I think a lot of the same things are at work here, um, as were with, you know, maybe Jim Harbaugh not getting a job for a couple of years. Um, and it certainly were with Mike Vrabel being on the sidelines this year as well. Albert, can you explain 
why through the Dynasty documentary, which, oh, no, excuse me, the Dynasty infomercial <laughs> and the uh, and the quotes that are attributed in this article to Kraft, the animosity towards somebody who won six Super Bowls for their franchise, went to eight yeah. and obviously increased the value of their franchise. Can you explain or get your hands around any of this? I think, you know, I, I think he just really wants to get in the Hall of Fame, you know, and I think that there's some uh, an element of legacy shopping going on, Michael. Um, you know, I think um, the, this is based on the book by Jeff Benedict, and that was, I mean, more or less a craft biography. So if you read the book, um, you sort of knew what to expect here, that it would be really um, the dynasty through the eyes of um, the guy in charge. And... Um, you know, I, I do think that there's a little insecurity there and, um, you know, concern that when Tom left and won a Super Bowl somewhere else, well, you know, now that leaves two people. And, you know, when you're reaching for credit, it's clear that, you know, Tom's legacy is secure and the fact that he went and won a championship somewhere else. So we've seen proof of concept there in another place. And, um, you know, if Bill were to go somewhere else, say Atlanta, and win big there, well, what does that leave, you know, for, for the guy who owns the team? And so, um, you know, I do think that, you know, at, at 82 years old, um, there's a desire to write your own legacy here and to make sure that your legacy is secure. And, and Robert Kraft's a great owner. I mean, you know, Michael, you worked for him. You know that. Um, you know, but I do think, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, a, a guy is looking to, to to really make sure that that the history views him in the way that he wants to be seen. And, um, you know, it can be tricky with owners, you know, and if you look over the course of history, um, you know, what does that what does everybody remember Eddie DeBartolo for? They don't remember him for the four championships or five championships so much as they remember him for how it ended, you know, with the with the riverboat thing in Louisiana. How does everybody look at Jerry Jones now? Do they remember him for the three championships or do they remember him for walking away from from Jimmy Johnson? I'd say it's the latter, you know? So the the legacy of an owner can be very, very difficult. I think Robert Kraft probably recognizes that as being overly aggressive and trying to make sure, you know, history again sees him the way he wants to be seen. Michael, I'll let you reflect on that. Well, I mean, I think to me, and I've said this many times, Robert Kraft belongs in the Hall of Fame for hiring Belichick. Eddie DeBarlow got in the Hall of Fame for hiring Bill Walsh and building his organization into an incredible culture. But I think when you are overtly trying to get in the Hall of Fame, when you're publishing books that are autobiography that you've commissioned and you're doing a, an infomercial, then all of a sudden you're trying to get credit when you should just sit back and accept the credit for making a great decision, a bold decision. <laughs> Because the back page of the New York Post the day that he hired Belichick was by Ian O'Connor, uh, this was going to be a disaster. And yet it proved to win six Super Bowls and go to eight titles. So that's really all you need to say. Now, if you want to get credit for the minutia of what actually transpired through the, through the, through the organization, that's something I never witnessed. So I, I think to me, anytime you try to overtly pat yourself on the back with a long arm, it makes you look shallow. It makes you look insecure. And I think DeBartolo just stood behind it and allowed his decision to speak for itself, which is what I don't think Kraft's doing. And I think that's hard. And Stormy, I, I just just to piggyback on what Michael's saying, I'd agree. You know, I, I think his resume is good enough to get in the Hall of Fame based on what he's done in setting up the organization, hiring Bill, and, um, you know, in, in contributing to the league the way that he's contributed um, from a broadcast perspective and all of that. This just sort of comes across as insecurity to me, you know, in that like he I don't think people react well to these sorts of things where they feel like you're overtly going and, and, and looking for credit. And I mean, look, like that contributor category is tough because you're dealing with some I, I'd say it's like a little bit more vague than 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 with, you know, the player category. And so do you put him in now over a guy like Mike Shanahan, who half the off half the league is running his offense? He won two Super Bowls. I don't know, you know, but, you know, if you're dealing with a, you know, a, a category where things are a little vague, you can certainly see where a voter might be turned off 
by something like this and, and winds up going the other way on him. Yeah, that, that insecurity and, and animosity with somebody that you had so much success, success with certainly feels a, a little bit odd. Albert Breer, MMQB, joining us here on the Lombardi line on the Progressive Guest Line. You wrote a lot this week about the state of the Washington Commanders, and they today are hosting a whole bunch of quarterbacks, the four big ones outside of Caleb Williams and J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and Michael Penix Jr., what should we, from the outside looking in, take away from that process? Well, I mean, this is the way Adam Peters learned to do it in San Francisco. This is the way that they've done it there for years, where they bring in large groups of people. Um, I think the Niners might actually be doing that today, doing the same thing today mm -hmm. to much less fanfare, of course. Um, the number I had heard was 22 of the 30 visitors are coming in today. Um, I think it's an efficient way to use your time as they see it. They obviously are trying to set up a new program and they're through their off season program with Dan Quinn leading that, um, you know, they're in draft meetings and obviously this is a very, very important draft for them. Oh, I, I also think, and I defer to Michael on this one, but I, I think it does allow you to see the four quarterbacks, um, in a more natural environment and how they interact with their peers Maybe one of them or two of them take a leadership role in some of the things that are going on. You get to see them in a little bit of a competitive environment with some stress on them. Um, and, you know, I think from that perspective, it makes sense. Now, what you lose, I think, is the individual time. But I know the commanders feel like through, you know, the combine, pro days, private workouts, the Zoom calls they're allowed to do. They've had a lot of one on one time with Jaden Daniels and J.J. McCarthy and Drake May and Michael Penix. And they will have, and they did have some individual time with those guys this morning where they could cross some T's and dot some I's. And getting to do it at the end of the process, too, I think is an important piece of it, too. Today's the last day that you're allowed to have guys in on 30 visits. So, um, you know, ostensibly, that would allow for you to have the most information when you're getting the last chance to see those guys face to face. Real quickly, Albert, I agree. It, it is the best way to do it. Real quickly, though, four quarterbacks or five in the first round, in your opinion? I So I don't think Bo Nix goes in the first round. <clears throat> I think Michael Penix's stock is a little volatile. Um, I hate the term. Um, <laughs> I hate the term rising up draft boards. I think it's normally a, a load of crap. I think it's just all of us on the outside, the media, as we gather information and talk to more people catching up to what the league thinks about people. But I do think to some degree it might exist a little bit with Michael Penix. Um, the sense I get, Michael, is that um, the sense I get is the coaches like Michael Penix a little more than the scouts do. And and there are reasons for that. I think part of it is that he's really good in areas you can't coach. And coaches feel like you can kind of fill in the blanks with the rest. Great deep ball accuracy anticipates. You see some things that 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 you really like that 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 maybe are more a little more intuitive. Coaches feel like they can work with the rest. Um, so I could see him going 13 to the Raiders. I could see him going 16 to the Seahawks. I could see him maybe, um, you know, going somewhere in the second round if he doesn't wind up in, uh, in one of those two places. So volatile. Uh, I think there is a possibility he goes in the top half of the first round. I think there's also a possibility he slides to the top of the second. Albert, you're awesome. Thank you so much for the time today. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSEN, the sports betting network. If there's one thing that we know about our audience, it is that they love the betting splits page on vcin.com. So we're helping you out right now for a limited time. We're offering two weeks of our exclusive betting splits for free when you sign up at vcin.com slash splits. Our betting splits page is updated with DraftKings odds every five minutes so you can see the changes in action, find out where the public's betting based on the number of tickets, where the money doesn't match the public opinion. And of course, it's not just for the games today, but future events by date as well. Take advantage though. Again, this is a limited time offer. vcin.com slash splits is where you need to go to claim those free two weeks of access to the vcin betting splits page. Back here on the Lombardi line, Michael Lombardi, Stormy Bond and Tony with you and the one and only Harry Gagnon, joining us on the Progressive Guest Line, host of the Against All Odds podcast with Cousin Sal. And as if we weren't singing your praises enough last week with the UConn to win both Final Four games by 10-plus points prop, 
This week we're coming off of a Masters dub. And how about Ludwig Oberg for what he did finishing in second, Harry? You're on a yeah. heater. Cool Look off, my you. friend. Yeah, you know, just ran one, two. What are you going to do? It happens once in a while. It happens. That was great, though. It was, uh, you know, uh, another Masters where um, another four-stroke win. Rom had it the year before. Kind of a little uneventful um, down the stretch. You know, it, you know, I know uh, Oberg made a little bit of a run, uh, but he had that bad that issue on eleven where he had the double bogey, so it dropped him two strokes. But I mean, Scheffler's just amazing, isn't he? It just it, he's so calm, so under control. His iron play is by far, I think, the best in golf right now. And he made some some crazy putts. He was, I believe, eight or nine. Go ahead, at least heading into Sunday, seven under on those par fives. And when you're at the Masters, you got to take advantage of those par fives especially on the back nine on 13 and 15. And he did just that. Yeah. I mean, he was, I mean, there was nothing he couldn't do. Right. I mean, it was just remarkable how he was going and processing. And, and every time you thought they could make a run, everybody faltered and he came right back, but you gotta, you know, your tip is, I mean, I mean, the, really the big tip is going to a Springsteen concert offers you a well-rounded <laughs> sense of what's happening. You know, it, it, it's bring, it brings you to light, Michael. It, 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 it you're clear, your brain's a lot clear, you can think a little bit better. And, you know, by the way, Springsteen tomorrow in basically my hometown of Syracuse, and I'm actually not going. Yeah, of course not. Well, yeah, why would you? Yeah. You're why just... would I want to go to upstate New York, right? <laughs> why, why, why do that? Why do that when you can go overseas, yeah. go everywhere you want to go? Awesome, right. <laughs> awesome stuff, Harry, as always. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more winners coming through in the NBA as the play-ins roll on. We had the Western Conference play-in games get underway yesterday. The Eastern mm-hmm. Conference today. Also, real quickly, big news that for the follow-up play-in game, Pelicans-Kings coming up on Friday, Zion Williamson officially listed out out for that game according to a report from Adrian Wojnarowski has a hamstring injury he'll be evaluated again in the next couple weeks that line has seen significant movement Pelicans open minus two they're now getting one and a half points on that line total 214 and a half so I don't know if you have any opinion on that game or the two games in the Eastern Conference coming up today Heat 76ers Hawks Bulls talk me through it yeah well real quick on the Kings Pelicans that's a, that's a huge hit for the Pelicans but again you know they are doing this to themselves. They lose last night uh, after coming from behind. But even on Sunday, they had their chance to beat the Lakers on Sunday and didn't do it. And they could have been the sixth seed. The Suns would have been the seven. They could have avoided all this mess. And Zion wouldn't have got hurt. Now they're in a lot of trouble. And now, like you mentioned, the the, uh, spread is flipped. Now the Kings are the favorites. So that's very interesting. Interesting game on Friday. But tonight, tonight in the the Sixers heat game, I have a little bit of a player prop here. I've got Tyrese Maxey. Over 23 and a half points, guys, uh, at minus 125. Uh, before, by the way, speaking of prediction, I myself, before the season started, went on against all odds. We gave out season uh, um, awards. I gave out most improved player, Maxi, at 11 to 1. He's a lock for that. So that that's a nice little winner at 11 to 1 here. And this last three games versus Miami, he's went for, like I said, you got to get 24 points here to get a winner. He's gone for 30 or more in his last three games against Miami. When Embiid has been out this year, the 23-year-old has really stepped up his game when they needed him to, and he's gone for 24 points or more in eight of his last 10 games, which includes 10 days ago going for 52 against San Antonio. Yeah, well, I mean, he he's hard to defend for Miami. They can't stop him mm-hmm. off the dribble. It's really painful. And then he's been able, as you got as cited, because of his shooting improvement and from the three-point line, you know, he's deadly from outside there. So do you have a do you, do you have a preference on the line here in the game, Harry? Are you going to take the, the heat in the five and a half? Or are you going all sixers? You know, I, I, I just don't I don't know if uh, I fully trust to lay those points with the sixers. I don't really have a side and a feel in this one because I could see this game being um, a defensive struggle. I could see this being like a 105, 100 game. So I'm going to lay the lay off of it and just go into the player prop with Maxi. But on Saturday, guys, this weekend, this weekend, I got a teaser for you guys. They, they, when the playoffs do start, there's already some matchups out there, obviously, and there's some uh, some lines. How about this? For a two-leg, five-point teaser, I'm going to take the Suns up to plus seven against Minnesota, and I'm going to take the Indiana-Minnesota-Milwaukee um, uh, game to go over 227. Phoenix 
three and zero, three and zero versus Minnesota. I know Minnesota's been the better team this year, but Phoenix just matches up nice against Minnesota. Three and zero against them this year. All three wins by double digits as well. The big three for Phoenix are now kind of healthy. I think Beal had thirty six for the Suns uh, against the T Wolves on Sunday in Minnesota. So give me Phoenix pushing it up from plus two to plus seven, and I'm going to take a, like I said, Indiana Minnesota or Minnesota, Indiana Milwaukee over two twenty seven from two thirty two to two. 27. Uh, no Giannis. I still think no problem still when it comes to being point, being scored in this game. Uh, Pacers first in the NBA in points scored. Milwaukee was fourth. And in their five meetings this year, five meetings, guys, their total points were 250, 247, 266, 235, and 272. Give me the over there, 227, with, like I said, the Suns pushing up to plus seven. There's Harry Gagnon. You're just teasing Harry. Harry, you're just teasing her to death. I mean, she's sitting there with her eyes. I mean, like, when you get into these teasers, it's just like yeah. I could see her going like, okay, all right, what time can I get to that window? I know I have to do something right after the show. But, like, but I, see, I, I Michael, just see it. Like, and she's... I'm, just, I'm, waiting. I'm, waiting for, I'm waiting for some at some point Stormy to text me, Michael. Just showing me all her bets and teasers. I, I, I'm waiting for it. But see, what I was going to say is Harry <laughs> so said Harry said the quiet thing out loud. Usually that's my commercial break conversation. The teasing <laughs> basketball totals. We're not supposed to say that out loud. <laughs> right, right, no, right. No, I, 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 right. I, I love it, Harry. You know, go with what feels right and what your research indicates. Your former sportsbook supervisor, you know what's going on. Also, a reminder, check out the Against All Odds podcast wherever you get your podcast. Harry Gagnon joining us on the Progressive Guest Line. You also have taken a look at some of these series prices. And you mentioned already the injury to Giannis Antetokounmpo. Yeah. We know he's not going to be available that first game. But with that, we've seen a big series sh- price shift with the Pacers and Bucks. What are you looking at there? Do you think Indiana could have a shot here? I do. I really do. I mean, like we mentioned, we're not sure when Giannis will return, if he will even at all. Uh, the Pacers were 4-1 and one versus the Bucks this season. They averaged 129 points a game against them. Since the highly overrated Doc Rivers, Took over as head coach uh, for Milwaukee. He has a record of 17 and 19. Milwaukee comes limping into the playoffs, going three and eight down the stretch, and that includes losses to Washington, Memphis, and Toronto. Um, you know, tra- you know, trading for Siakam midseason here has been a big move for the Pacers. Um, he's averaged 21 and eight for them. I think he could be the difference. I think you know, obviously, Pacers. Even money here, that's a huge swing of what we thought it would be probably a month and a half ago if these teams met. I like the Pacers. I think they get it done. Yeah. You know, you got to. I mean, this, is, this isn't this is Doc's season. I mean, it, he was, what, 17-19 yeah. and 19 in the regular season? And then you get the playoffs. This is when Doc uh, isn't usually as good. How about – what's your handicap on the on the, on the, the, the Dallas Mavericks who are playing really well right now? You know, they finished with 50 wins, which was incredible, where they were started after the trade deadline against the, as Stormy calls them, the L.A. Ifers. <laughs> I know, right? Well, listen, I, you know what I like in this? I'll give you, you know, see if you guys like this one. It's going to be a great series, and this is the one I pointed out on Against All Odds, which I'm really interested in the most um, come this weekend. Uh, I like this series. I don't know who's going to win this one. I think it's going to go seven. I think it's, I don't know who wins it. But I think it goes seven. And if you want to bet just that it goes seven games, you can get plus 230 on there. I really like this. I mean, this might be, again, the most exciting of the first round series. So much star power in the series. Uh, could be similar to the wild series these two played in 2021 when the road team won the first six games until the Clippers prevailed in game seven. I don't know who wins this series, but I think it's a slugfest and it goes seven games. Yeah, it should be a fun series. Clippers plus 105, Mavericks a slight favorite minus 125. But I call them the ifers because do they not feel like the NBA equivalent to the Jets where we're like, if they're healthy, they <laughs> seem unstoppable, but well, big if. Kawhi, George, you know, you, you got to, it's the same story every single time with these guys. And also, George has under un, un, hasn't been great when it comes to playoff games down the stretch either no question about it everybody that is harry gagnon at aao harry on Great x work, harry. the against all odds podcast you're the man we'll talk to you next week
This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSEN, the sports betting network. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and more. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code VSIN. When you do, new customers who bet $5 get 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's VSIN, V-S-I-N, as your promo code only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Maybe a stupid one, but I'm just spitballing here. Can it make you say why not? That wasn't a stupid question. It's time for Why Not Wednesday. I mean, why not? You know when they say it's so crazy it just might work? Boy, does that open get me going as we welcome you into a Why Not Wednesday to round out oh, today's edition go. of the Lombardi here Line. We Ooh, go. Michael, we got some good stuff for you. And because we're coming off NBA I, I conversation. Saw, I listening to you guys. <laughs> I listened to you guys gang up on me in the break. I I, I, I I saw it, yes. I don't know what you're talking about. I just have some questions. But uh, that one's a little lower down the list. We'll get to it in number three or four. We're going to start in the NBA because the Lakers yesterday in their win cemented their spot in the first round of the playoffs against the Denver Nuggets, a team that swept them, of course, in the Western Conference Finals a year ago. They've taken some money, Michael, already here early, down from plus 350 to plus 250. But is it the right side? Can the Lakers get some redemption in their first round series with the defending champs? Plus 250, could you say why not? Oh, say why not to defeat them. No, you can't get me to say why not. I, I'm just not going to go there. I, I'm leaning more towards they won't get swept than I would be them def- winning. So you're not getting me on the why not on that. I just, to me... <laughs> Seven game series always come down to the best team. You can certainly pull upsets, but the best team, the ones that execute and play well and are able to sustain the, their ability, which I don't think the Lakers can. I mean, look, they struggled on the road last night with the Pelicans, a team that they ultimately dominated most of the season. And if Zion doesn't get hurt, I'm not sure they win that game. Now, it probably was going that direction, but Zion was playing at a high, high level. They had just no size, so I can't go there, Stormy. I'm sorry. All right. I got to ask the question, though, Um, and it was one of the closer sweeps. Uh, That's such a lame thing to say. A closer sweep. The games were close. They got good. They started to figure things out a little bit uh, with Rui Hachimura, right? I I don't know. We'll see. I'm not putting my money on it, so I, I'm with you, though. I don't, I can't say why not, but I think it's a fun discussion. Maybe they can be live a little bit. Can Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy be live at three? There's been a lot of talk about the Vikings being the team to trade up, take him at four, him being that fourth quarterback off the board, but could he leapfrog and go to New England at plus 205? Yeah, I could, you could get me to why not that one. Because, again, I don't know if anybody has – the answer and the perfect way to uh, handicap or evaluate the quarterback. I think everybody's list is different. And I think you've got to take that into, into account. I don't think you can use last year's data. You know how I feel about last year's data yeah. or any data that evolves change. It's irrelevant. It's a completely different year. So I think you have to take that. I, it would not surprise me. Would I do it? No. But I wouldn't have picked Anthony Richardson, the third pick. Of the, I, I didn't think his college tape was good enough. Now, he had incredible size. He had incredible athleticism. And you were betting the, on the come. No question. I got that. But the third pick in the draft. Yeah. The third pick in the draft. But I guess the, you know, you're so desperate for a quarterback. Logic gets thrown out of the window. We'll see if it works out for the Colts. But I can't say that you couldn't pick him because I think ultimately every team's going to be different. Sure. And there are a lot of questions in the top five, not only about who will be picked, but quite frankly, who's doing the picking at those selections? Like, will the Cardinals trade out? Will the Chargers trade out? We don't know. An interesting prop, though, for Joe Alt, who is considered the best offensive tackle, best offensive lineman in this draft coming out of Notre Dame. Could he go top five? Like, I'm thinking if the Chargers keep that number five selection, they go offensive line, it's plus 450 for Alt to be a top five selection. Could you say why not to that? You know, I could because I think if if they can't move, they're going to take an offensive lineman. And Alt makes sense for them, right? And so he's big, he's tough, he's physical, he played in a good conference, he's played against Michigan. You know, Jim knows him, recruited him. So I could see that. Now, I think you've got to decide, is the Oregon State Fiaga 
Is he as good or better? Could he be the first? A lot of people think he might be the first tackle taken. Is Latham going to be the first tackle taken? There's a bunch of tackles that are really good. I think Alt's the best of them. So I would go with that. I would say why not? So we don't have a consensus. Joe Alt seems to be the top of that list, but it's not consensus best offensive line. Same thing for best defensive player. Dallas Turner is a minus 135 favorite to be the first offensive player selected, but it's not consensus that he is the end-all, be-all top defensive prospect. Could you say why not to UCLA edge rusher Leatu Latu as the first defensive player selected plus 450 the price? Leatu Latu, oh, I could definitely say why not. I meant plus 280. I'm we sorry. have the wrong thing. I, I, I read the screen. It says plus 450, but it's plus 280. Plus 280. Okay. I'd still do it at plus 280. I think it's a good number. Look, this is really going to come down to if you don't win this bet, it's going to be because of his neck surgery and the fusion that sometimes teams can't, you know, it's not good. Teams worry about longevity of the player. Understandable. But in terms of who's the better player, I think this kid is really, really good. He speed rushes to power. He's athletic. He's got instincts all over the field. He's one of my favorite players in the draft. I definitely see him as a top 10 player, assuming he gets past the physical, the medical. Questions about the medical. Uh, Another theme for Michael Penix Jr. in this year's draft. And you already know that I placed a bet on him this week to be a first round pick. I'll take you one further. Could you say why not to the Las Vegas Raiders taking Michael Penix plus 260? I could say why not to that. Definitely. I see that. That's what I see him doing. You know, because look, the the Raiders are probably, would they do it at their first pick? I don't know. Could they trade back into the first round? Yeah, I could see that. I think that's where the market is. And I think that's where you have to be very careful about thinking it's only going to be four quarterbacks. I think there's no question that, you know, we're going to, that McCarthy, May, Williams, and Daniels are going to go in the first round. Now it comes down to which team that didn't get a quarterback is willing to come back in. Today we saw the Giants bring Bo Nix in and they have Spencer Rattler. Spencer Rattler is a popular guy around the league. Everybody loves the way he plays. If he was 6'2", he'd be a first rounder. If he were 6'2", he'd be a first rounder. A lot of teams like him. So for me, I could see them jumping back into the first just to make sure. Because here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to go to bed Thursday night. And you absolutely say you're the Denver Broncos and you absolutely need a quarterback. And now you're competing with four teams to get the 33rd pick. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So while we're on quarterbacks, Michael, like I said, I have Michael Penix Jr. Mm -hmm. going in the first round. I personally, as much as I like Bo Nix as a person, do not view him as a first round selection. I think a team would be reaching should they go get him. But you said, so this is what everybody's been waiting for. What we were talking about in the commercial break. You said you learned something new about Bo Nix and the people that you have been talking to. So tell us what you can share. And if you think Bo Nix, you could say why not to him being a first round pick at plus 160. Well, again, he falls in that category. I wouldn't pick him in the first round, but I think certain teams see him very athletic, very coachable, great person. You know, I know Mike Pritchard was thought he was, a, a, you know, yesterday when we had Mike on for, a, for the first time in a long time, Mike thought he was an entitled kid. Yeah, I made some calls yesterday. I don't see that. You know, people don't see that. And so I think he's his work ethic, he's a little bit, let's call him J.J. McCarthy light. Okay. Okay. He's got all the characteristics of, what McCarthy does, but maybe not to the level that McCarthy did at winning a national championship. But look, there's a lot of love for the player, a lot of love for the player. And I think to me, you can't predict where this is going to go in terms of the first round. So, you know, could he go at 33? Yeah. I mean, I think what Harry said on his pod on the, on the, on just in the last block about him going over 35. Absolutely. I like that a lot in the first round. That would not shock me. Would I do it? No. But again, you're, we can't judge yeah. these picks until three years from now. No, and that's a good point, too. We talked about it a lot yesterday and throughout the draft process. It's also, it's not what we would do. It's what we think these teams will do, what we're hearing these teams will do. So, still up for debate there. One more here. Draft position prop set at 13 and a half for Toledo quarterback Quinion Mitchell. Could you say why not him being drafted 13 or better at even money here. I personally think he goes 12 to Denver, so I like it. What do you think? I think anytime you can get a corner as good as Mitchell that can come in and start immediately, I think he goes in the top 10. And so I, I'm not ruling that oh. out. I, to me, I disagree 
with people that think this is all going to be offensive players. I think there's too many good defensive players that you better get your hands on. He's plus 370 to go in the top 10. I, I know this is a odds on number minus 190 to be the first corner off the board feels like one of the safer bets in my mind in this draft. No, no question. Okay, no question. See, and that's I don't mind in the draft betting minus prices if you feel really, really confident about it. So, Michael, I might right, might have right. to fire on another one. What am I going to do? Uh oh, there we go. There you go. Yeah, you got Harry got you going today. There's no question about that. Harry tickled your fancy. There's no doubt. We're on a roll. Uh, appreciate you. We'll see you tomorrow, Michael. Everybody enjoy your day and good luck in the Eastern Conference play and bets tonight.